Hans Berger is going to be coming up to speak. Uh, he's well educated, uh, got quite a few degrees. I can't even pronounce them. So, uh, but he's going to come up and share and uh, with us. And uh, so I would uh, encourage you to give him the same attention you would to me. And uh, God wants to equip us for certain things. So, um, and he wants to use him today. So come on up. Watch out for the forest around here, you know. So he, uh, him and his wife uh, are now living where? Front Range, where? Aurora, Colorado. Aurora. Um, so, and uh, anyway, he's done, they've done ministry there for at least 26 years, because that's how long Rich has known him, so probably longer than that. Yeah. Anyway, I'll let you run with it. Thanks. I got a big one. <laughs> I have a bigger one. Sorry, Dennis. Good morning. I was here many years ago. You're all in your other facility at the time. Some of you put up with me before and you're brave enough to show up again. So God's blessing on you guys. Um, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for mercy and for grace and for forgiveness and all these good gifts that you give us. And as we look at our country getting torn to shreds, Father, we are dismayed and um, don't understand. Father, give us hope. Give us uh, a passion for lost people, a passion for deceived people, and, and help us to honor you, Father, in all things. We pray this in your name. Amen. <clears throat> I started doing this message about a year and a half ago, um, and it's the message I thought I would never, ever have to speak to a church. Um, Dennis mentioned I've been in school forever. That's not necessarily a good thing, but one of the things that uh, was going on when I was at the University of Denver studying for a PhD many, many years ago now in the early 2000s, I ran into something called cultural theory. And uh, people would ask me, my degree was in theology, philosophy, and cultural theory. And people would say, well, I understand theology and I kind of understand philosophy. What is this cultural theory? And I said, it's just Marxism. And so we're gonna talk a little bit this morning about what's called critical theory, critical race theory, Critical legal theory it has dozens of names, just depending on who you talk to. And I never, ever wanted to bring this stuff into the church. And I thought, oh, this is what my professors are into. This is a joke. This will just languish in the academic world. And it has exploded into our culture over the last few years. It is a huge fight. And everybody and their mother now is writing a book about critical theory and all this kind of stuff. Well, I want to talk about justice because that's one of the issues that we're told that's from the riots in the streets and everything that this is really all about, it's about justice. So we hear about social justice and we hear about social justice warriors and these kind of things. And we wonder, what, what is that? Is that the same thing as what the Bible talks about? And so it's not. And I wanna address the message this morning is social justice versus biblical justice. What does the Bible say? So I'm gonna basically point out a couple things. I had to study philosophy for a long time now and I teach it at a couple of colleges in the Denver area. And 1,200 years before Plato ever wrote anything about justice or anything else, God spoke through Moses about the question of justice in the Torah, in the first five books. For example, in Genesis 18, 25, the Lord says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And we're introduced to this God, as Abraham's learning about who God is, who cares about what is right, what is just, what is the right thing to do? So from the very beginning of the Bible, it has justice as one of its major themes. Now let me take you to the very end of the book, 1,500 years later, when the Lord speaks to the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 6 and says this, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who are on the earth? These are the martyrs who were killed in the rapture, excuse me, in the tribulation. And their concern, their prayer is for God to be about justice, to God to avenge the loss. I was talking to my mother. This is completely not part of the sermon, but I was just talking to her a couple of days ago, and she was talking about all these murders from when she was a kid. And I said, Mom, the great news is there is a God who is a judge, and nobody gets away with anything. Mafioso doesn't get away with it. Nobody gets away with it. And, and uh, anyway, so the Bible is concerned about justice. 
And that's important to us. The normal Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. There's a lot of uses. There's hundreds of references to it. I'm going to race through some of them, and then we'll end up in the Old Testament as well. But I want you to think about some of these. For example, in Deuteronomy 18.20, it says that the Lord executes justice for the fatherless, for the widow, and for the sojourner. The Lord cares for the widow and the orphan and the traveler. Why is that important? It's one of the biggest themes in the Old Testament. It shows up in the prophets over and over again. Israel is judged for two reasons. One, their idolatry, and I would say accompanying that, because it comes out of the vein of worshiping false gods, that they literally steal from the most defenseless in the culture. They steal from the widow. I'm not a big, huge King James fan. I read from the ESV. I'm not criticizing the King James. But there's one time when it talks about this where the prophet says that the priests and the rulers and the, you know the people who are supposed to be protecting the weak that they grew fat that's the word it uses in king james it grew fat off the widow how do you steal from the most defenseless and the bible condemns that god is concerned with justice you don't take from those who cannot defend themselves in any situation and that shows up actually in quite a few different places in deuteronomy 16 19 it says this you shall not pervert justice you shall not show partiality now, this is going to be a big thing throughout my message this morning, but God condemns this in numerous passages all through the Torah and in the Proverbs, that God condemns those who show partiality to the rich or those who show partiality to the poor, those who show partiality to one brother over another brother. This comes up over and over again that God hates impartiality, that it is a perversion of justice. It is destroying justice to show partiality towards this group or other. And I would argue that it's Pretty much the normal way human beings act we show partiality to our own to our own community to our own tribe or something like this to people just like us that's the way this works and god hates this and he says it destroys that so if you're driven by i'm going to take care of my own whatever my own might be fill in the blank here then you have to understand that god is atta attacking that he promises that that does not produce justice it produces something else altogether in Deuteronomy, excuse me, in Proverbs 17, 23, we've learned that accepting a bribe perverts justice. Well, welcome to the world. I was a deputy sheriff for several years before God called me into ministry. Do I believe cops and judges can be bad? Oh, yeah. Just like every other group of people on this planet, just like every other country that exists. Uh, I've been, Haven itself is a mission group, and our main target is everybody, but... One of the things we do a lot of is we speak to people in cults, the big ones, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and all the world religions. But we also talk to people in little groups most of you have never heard of. And oftentimes we're finding out about groups that we've never heard of before. And it may not be a big deal to you, but to the 50 people and their family members who are in it, it's a big deal. It's destructive. Whether you're talking about the Heaven Gate type people or the garbage eaters or a zillion other groups most of you have never heard of. And that's the people we go after. And we try to talk to them. We try to reach these people. And one of the things that's very common with every cult leader I can think of is sex, money, and power. And if you see two, the third is hiding. It's just almost always there. And one of our dear friends that was a part of our ministry for years, Grace Adams, she was part of the David Koresh cult, the nasty little branch Davidians down in Waco in that fire. And she got saved through a remarkable story. If you want to go online and see her testimony, it's amazing. But her sister and brother-in-law, niece and nephew died in that fire. And she's Kiwi from New Zealand. There was a lot of Kiwis there. I did not know that. The media didn't really address that. But um, she just went to be with the Lord just a few weeks ago. And I'm so struck by the fact that as she talks about her experience in this cult that I see this in so many other different groups. David Koresh was all about sex, money, and power. And you see it with Joseph Smith, and you see it with Muhammad, and you just see it going right down the line, the same phenomena. So when I look at a political cult that's not necessarily religious, at least on the face of it, Guess what I see? I see the same thing. I see sex, money, and power driving things. When you see Black Lives Matter, and Antifa, and those that, which are just two of the biggest groups, there's hundreds of, the, of smaller groups in these in these protests and riots around the country. When I see their leadership, and you start reading this stuff, you realize, boy, we're seeing the same kind of stuff we see in the Branch Davidians, or we see in the early Mormon Church, all these other things. We see sex, money, and power driving the bus for these things, and this is not a good thing. All right. So God says, if you take bribes, if you're doing this for money, that's a perversion of justice. It's no partiality again, Proverbs 18, 15. If you are a politician, excuse me, I mean a liar, um, and you bear false witness, 
God says that is a mockery of justice. You are literally mocking justice if you go up in front of anybody and lie and tell a story and weave a tale, whatever version of that you want to hear. That that's also negative. That's also destructive of justice. So I'm hoping you're getting an idea. There's hundreds of more verses you can look up in your own concordance later on that talk about justice and what God is concerned with. But one of the things you got to know is God is obviously concerned with this whole justice thing. I'm going to make this even stronger. We all talk about a God who is love. You cannot be a God who loves and not be a just God. You cannot separate those things. That God's justice is just as much a part of his character because it's part of his love. Can you imagine a situation? I've actually had this conversation with the people I talked to. I talk to witches and Scientologists and rancher readers and a host of others at the psychic fairs and things we go to. And so one of the ideas is that God is just everything and everyone, and this world is basically an illusion. That's an old Hindu idea called Maya. And the Buddhists picked it up, and now you hear it from witches and all sorts of other people. And anyways, what's driving part of this is since the, everyone and everything is God, and since this whole world is illusion, then this whole thing about good and evil just gets washed right out. It doesn't really exist. And you can read dozens of New Age leaders and find this theme coming up. So every time I talk to people like this, I bring up evil. And I put it in their face. I call it the Hitler pill. So if God is sitting there in the middle of Auschwitz, where they're averaging 500 people killed per day, and God says, oh, I'm not a judge, that's fine with me. Is that a good God? If God was sitting in the middle of the killing fields in, in Cambodia, where one-fourth of the population is wiped out in three years, and God says, well, you know, I'm open-minded, accepting, and loving. That's all fine. I'm down with that. Is that a good God? Is that a loving God? I'm talking to this New Age character that we talked to for years named Sister Who. If you want to be haunted forever, go find his pictures online. Sister Who is a basically a cross-dressing homosexual man. He's always at the psychic fairs. We love this guy. We keep talking to him. He can't stand me. He gets all mad at me. Sometimes he'll talk to me. Sometimes he turns away. He's, he's kind of schizo about this whole thing. But anyways, we were talking one time, and I was bringing up the illustration because he's we're all God, and this world's an illusion. And I said, Sister Who, and again, he's dressed like a nun, and like oh, never mind, but he thoroughly believes we're all God. He thoroughly believes there's no such thing as good, good and evil. So I said, sister, sister, I'm sorry to be graphic, but this is what I told him. If there is a guy raping and murdering a little girl in front of you, are you telling me that you would not try to stop this? Now, he won't say yes, but I can see it in his face. He knows. He knows. Why does he know? Because Romans 2 says that even the non-Jew, the Gentiles, that's all of us for the most part, we know the law. It's in our hearts. We know that it's wrong to rape and murder. And he knows that if he says, yes, I would stop it, he's in trouble because now he's acknowledging there's evil and he doesn't want to go there. So I'm always hitting him with this kind of stuff and making him try to think about this. Well, he tells me a story that he was at Iliff which is a seminary, Methodist seminary, at the same time I was at DU, University of Denver. Whenever the Methodists founded universities across the country, they would have an accompanying seminary. So Duke, SMU, University of Denver has ILIF. And I had to take two classes there, and I was hated and despised beyond belief. Before they ever met me, they hated me because they knew I'd gone to a conservative seminary. That meant I believed the book. That meant I was a bad person. I had a fellow graduate student screaming at me in class. I just met her. Now, some people like the Humes have known me a long time. They have reasons to, you know, think I'm a bad guy. I get that. But she didn't even know me. She's screaming at me about the demon voice of God and all this bizarre stuff. I'd never even heard this before. But the enmity was, was boom, right in my face. So I'm going to teach you about something called intersectionality. Here's my example with Sister Who. Sister Who is a pagan. He believes he's God. He's male. He's white. He's um, homosexual. I don't know. Everybody get the picture here? This is who he is. <clears throat> Dresses as a nun when he comes to the psychic fairs. So I was telling him, you know, I had to take two classes at ILEF when I was at the University of Denver. And I was telling him, these people hated me. He says, oh, Bill, they hated me too. And I'm like, how could that possibly be? Now, I never even heard the word intersectionality, which is all over all the critical race theory of Abram Kendi and Robin DiAngelo and all these people. And he says, well, they hated me. And I said, how could they? You're the gold standard at ILIF. You're homosexual. Virtually 70 to 80% of all the new incoming class of Methodist ministers are homosexual. He says, Bill, you don't understand. I'm also a white male. I didn't get it. 
Well, this is part of understanding how in, this term intersectionality works. There's oppressors and oppressed. He had two o oppressed points. He's a homosexual and he's a pagan. That's good. Those are good things. You're righteous because of that. But he had the worst of all oppressor points. He's a white male. And it turns out the two oppressed points uh, don't count because the oppressor points. So he was hated at a school um, that was celebrating homosexuality and all this kind of stuff. So that's an introduction to where we're going in a few minutes. But I want you to read you another verse. This is Proverbs 21, 15, where it says this. When mishpat, when justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous. We enjoy seeing justice done. But it is terror to evildoers. So I teach logic. So flip this around for just a second. When injustice is done, when bad things are happening, the evil ones celebrate and the righteous mourn. So my point is, look who's cheerleading for what? When you see riots in the street, when you see people getting killed, when you see hundreds of millions of dollars of damage done, when you see looting stores all over the place, and you see people, very prominent people in the government and other places celebrating, cheering, this is a good thing, this is a righteous thing. When they're trying to tell you it's about race, and I'm going, how is this about race? When they're tearing down abolition statues, you want to tear down Confederate statues, that's one thing, but you want to tear down people who are fighting against slavery? And the first time I preached this message, they had just torn down, Black Lives Matter Antifa group had torn down and defaced the, the memorial to Frederick Douglass, one of the most important men in the history of this country, freed slave, who became a personal friend of Abraham Lincoln, who spoke routinely about the Lord's view of what the Confederate slave owners were doing. He castigated them using God's word. How can you possibly enslave your brothers in Christ? How is that right? I mean, Frederick Douglass is one of the best people that's ever been in this country. And they're tearing down his statue? How is this about race, if that's the case? How is it about race when two of the first six cops who were killed in the riots were black men? One from Oakland, one from St. Louis. How is that about race when black police officers are getting shot? And we hear all this stuff about defunding the police and emptying the prisons. And you have to understand there's something much larger going on. Again, I was a deputy for three years. I know what it means if you get rid of cops in prisons. It's not pretty. It is not pretty. It is horrible beyond belief. Anyways, when you see people cheering for that, something wrong is being done. All right? And that's what the scriptures warn us about. All right, so let me summarize this real quickly. What is God's justice all about? Well, we're learning it's there's no partiality. This is huge. There's so many verses that say this. There's no bribes. Okay, you can't sweeten the deal and ensure your path. There's no politicians, I mean false witnesses, no liars. There's a special concern for the defenseless. If you know people are being hurt that cannot defend themselves and you're not trying to stick up for it, there's something wrong. Because God says we should. Let me give you uh, two bad examples of somebody who prays on the, on the weakest. One is Hindu, very famous guru named Sai Baba. He's never came to the United States. I think he's dead now. It's the biggest Afro I've ever seen. It's just huge. And Sai Baba went to Canada, and he's all over And You can watch videos of him on YouTube. He does this thing where he waves his hand out of his robe, and he produces mostly ashes. And you can see thousands of people lining the pathway where he goes, hoping to get the ashes given to them so they can spread it all over their face. This cleanses their karma, um, their action. It's all bizarre Hindu stuff. Anyways, but when he's around important people or rich people, he'll do his little hand wave, and he'll produce a diamond ring or a ruby necklace or something like this. To which some people in India pointed out, shouldn't it be the other way? Shouldn't the politicians get ashes and the poor people get the rich things? But that doesn't work. So Sai Baba was all over the world collecting money from people who think he's God on earth, literally. This is a bad guy, all right? And he's a fraud, he's a bad magician. This whole thing is a fraud. I won't go into all the details. But let me give you a so-called Christian equivalent, and that's Benny Hinn who also has had a long history of faking miracles, along with Kenny Copeland and all these guys, all bad guys. Well, Benny Hinn goes to the poorest places on this planet. My wife and I have a passion for the Philippines. So it's not really necessarily part of Haven, but it's become that. So this is the first, we're supposed to be in the Philippines coming back right now. We're usually there for the whole month of July. And we adopted four Filipino kids. And <clears throat> the first time we went, I had a sister-in-law who's Filipino. I had many friends from the military that served in Clark and Subic Bay back in the 70s. 
I heard about the poverty. I read about it. It's a whole different thing to see it. It is overwhelming to see it and see thousands of kids on the streets and no place. It's just hard. There's a, two of our kids come from a trash dump in Manila called Smoky Mountain. It's 200,000 people living in this giant trash dump. One of my friends was there 20 years ago and he said, when one of the uh, ferries came up to dump the new trash onto the trash dump, it looked like an anthill had erupted because everybody wanted to be there for the fresh trash. Welcome to Smoky Mountain. Anyways, so if you can go to that place, you can go to Manila and you can take money from them, but he is, that's not enough. He also goes to Kampala in Uganda, another terribly poor place. And he goes to Calcutta and he's not the only one. And you can go to the poorest places on these planets and take their money. There is something wrong. You promise them they're going to get rich. The word faith movement is all over the Philippines and it's all over Kampala. One of my former students, a Ugandan man, was telling me about this. It's all over the place. They are taking money from the poorest people on this planet. You have no conscience if you take money from the poorest people on this planet. Don't tell me you're from God. Don't even tell me you believe in a God if you think that it's okay to steal money from the most poor people that live on this planet. OK, God hates that. It's the destruction of misfog. It's the destruction of his will for us. OK, so that's all bad enough, but it's good to know what God says. So let me give you what the bad guys say. This is the part I really didn't want to ever have to give out. What is this cultural theory or critical theory or critical race theory or a zillion other names? It's all Marxism. So you might ask, why should I care if it's Marxism? Who is this Marx clown? Well, because of him. I'd estimate somewhere close to 150 million people have died in the last 150 years. So it might be worth our while to understand at least a tiny little bit of who this man was. Racist to the core, ironic that he's so often listed up as anti-racist. Um, lazy, never worked a job in his life, lived off rich people, giving him money. An ethnic Jew who hated Jews, his family became Lutheran, he hates God with every ounce of his being. That's Karl Marx. And uh, just to give you an idea of where some of Marx's ideas from, he was a student under a very famous philosophy in Germany named GWF Hegel. Why should you care about some dead philosopher? You shouldn't. He was a bad guy. But Hegel said he was Lutheran, but he was more of a Hindu. Everything and everyone is God. He called it the Weltgeist, the world spirit. So if you want to see God working in the world, you just look at nature. Just look at history. That's God working. And his best example of this, so here's Karl Marx sitting in this class, listening to all this stuff. His best example of God, the whole God, the, the Lord of the universe, is Napoleon Bonaparte, who at this point had killed hundreds of thousands of people from all across Europe to Egypt into Russia and stuff like this. This is his example of God working in the world. So if we wonder why Marx, who was an atheist, didn't believe in this God, but still believed that that process of nature, he's a big fan of Darwin, so whatever nature does is good, that that's somehow a good process. So the fact that millions have died in Marxist revolutions around the world, it's not a problem. That's just the way the world works. That's the way nature works, or in Hegel's case, the way God works. And there's a famous story about a very famous depressed Danish philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard, the founder of existentialism, who came down to hear the old German speak. And again, I know you're all bored with this stuff, but just give me a minute with it. And Kierkegaard listens to Hegel's praising Napoleon Bonaparte as an example of God working in the world. And Kierkegaard famously says, famously says, the death of millions may not mean anything to Hegel, but my death means something to me. And existentialism is born out of that whole idea that we ought to care about these kinds of things. Well, anyways, Marx teaches there's two classes in the world. This is old school. This is OG Marx, okay? You not hear this language so much anymore. It's shifted. But understand that. There's two classes. There's the proletariat, that's the workers, okay? And then there's the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the landowners, the farmers, the shop owners, the rich, the aristocrats, the nobility of Europe, all this kind of stuff. And that's it. There's no possibility of being a good oppressor. You cannot be a good farmer. You cannot be a good shop owner. You cannot be a good nobleman. And there's no possibility of being a bad proletariat. If you're a worker, you're just... Everything you have is, is, is righteous and good. Every, the way you act is righteous and good. So you have to kill the bourgeoisie to get what you rightfully should have. That's okay. And you can see this across the French Revolution long before Marx, and you can see it in the Russian Revolution long after Marx, the same mentality. How did they 
oppressors get their stuff. Well, they stole it from the workers. So Marx is very famous for his, one of his last important lines is, workers of the world unite. No more nations, no more countries, no more cultures or societies, just workers. And the way to make the world right is to take back what is yours. The farmer who owns his land, he stole that. The little guy who has a shoe store over here, he stole that. So take that stuff. Take over the means of production was his language. That's old school Marx, okay? And something really interrupted old school Marx. They'd taken over Russia and they were moving this way in China and other places. And then comes World War II and Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, who are also socialists. Our media is constantly trying to paint these guys as conservative capitalists. That's just 100% lie. You cannot read anything Hitler wrote or anything Mussolini wrote without realizing how often they talk about what good socialists they are. In fact, the term Nazi, National Socialist Workers' Party, that's what the term Nazi actually means. So it's funny that the Antifa people are calling everybody else Nazis. When they're actually representing Nazism in its truest form, I, that's another story. Anyways, there's people wondering about this. There's fights going on in Germany and Italy between old school OG versions of this and other people, socialists and communists of different stripes, just Lenin versus Trotsky, all this bizarre stuff. And these guys lose, the guys I'm gonna talk about that have influenced our culture so much right now. So there's a group called the Frankfurt School who were opposing Hitler. They were world's communists. They didn't want countries. They didn't want boundaries. They want the workers to take over the means of production. And Hitler had a whole different path. Hitler was a national socialist. What does that mean? The way Hitler rose to power and won against the international communists was he stressed das Boot and das Land, the blood and the land, to be a good German is what's important. We don't care about the people's movement in China or anywhere else. We care about Germany. And to a country that was very much in a terrible depression, people responded to that. Mussolini did the same thing in Italy. We, the glory of the Roman Empire, that's your heritage, and we can bring it back again. We don't care about anybody else but us. National, not international. And so the Frankfurt School, a bunch of really lousy guys that you never want to hear, Adorno and Horkel and all these guys, they flee to America, where, of course, we give them university positions, and they're nasty as could be. Gramsci, the Italian guy that's sitting in prison writes these letters which i had to read all this stuff and gramsci's wondering why did we lose how could we possibly lose communism is the way the evolution is taking us it'll all work out but somehow we got side railed by these nationalist guys so coming out of the frankfurt school after the war they went back to frankfurt germany where they get their name and gramsci's papers are published and it's all about a whole different shift in marxism we're leaving og behind we're going to get to where we're at right now and so they talked about something called the long march through the institutions. We are going to bring Marxism into people, but instead of a violent overthrow like Marx advocated, we're going to feed it to you a spoon at a time. We're going to put it in education. We're going to put it in nursing. We're going to put it in psychiatry. We're going to put it in the church. We're going to put it in politics. We're going to get Marxism in literally every bit of the culture. And it's now erupted on us. One of my, just give you an illustration how much I mean when they're trying to get Marxism into everything. One of my friends at, at DU was doing his doctoral dissertation. That's kind of an important book you have to write that nobody will read. His whole dissertation was on Marxism and the Texas Rangers baseball team. And I remember when I heard this, I go, are you kidding me? What? How is that a dissertation? How's that an educational thing? He said, Bill, you don't even understand. He was right at that point. I didn't get exactly how much you have to put Marxism in everything. So instead of bourgeoisie and proletariat, we hear two different terms now. We hear about oppressors and oppressed. I mentioned intersectionality. Here's where it comes to, into, into play. Oppressors are anybody who is rich or anybody who is powerful or owns production or is white. Now this is a twist. This is not selling this way. The communism in the Philippines, which has been around a long time, doesn't emphasize this at all because it's not a national issue there. It's not really a national issue here. The people that are doing this stuff don't care about race, despite what they say. They care about power, and that's very important. Race is just the tool they're using. So critical theory becomes critical race theory, with just one version of it. So in this whole thing, oppressors are people who have had power. So we hear all this language about white supremacists, white, you know, whiteness, we got to get rid of whiteness at Coca-Cola. That just came out a few months ago. It's racist to mow your yard. It's racist to brush your teeth. I mean, there's a zillion varieties of this stuff. And it's like every one of these guys is once they're 15 minutes of fame. And I want to get noticed because I talk about the racist to wearing glasses. You know, you're racist for literally everything. 
So this is one of the ways this is permeated into the culture. So there's oppressors and oppressed. So if you look at the founders of Black Lives Matter, who are very open about their hatred of God, their hatred of all things Christian, and on and on and on. The three main ladies that founded were all black, lesbian, Wiccans, pagans of some sort. Now, what does that mean? They have all the good oppressed points. They are virtuous. They are righteous because of their cause. The fact that, for example, Patricia Cullors, one of the three main ladies, has bought all these multi-million dollar homes in the last several months. Well, that just is supposed to be what evil white supremacist racist media is telling people about this. No, they're just reporting the facts at this point. They're grifters. They're just taking people's money. And they're really good at it. They're getting a lot of money from the NFL and the NBA and all sorts of other people. Brought in oh, several hundred million dollars in just the last few years. And they're profiting off it. They're getting TV contracts. They're getting all sorts they're going to show up with Oprah. I mean, it's all a good thing. Well, is it? But people who are on the other side of it, here's the evil. I represent everything evil. I know this. I'm a white, male, heterosexual Christian. And that's all bad. And probably the worst of all is that I'm Christian. That's the thing that's most hated because Christianity is seen as synonymous, 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 synonymous with capitalism. And they hate capitalism because Marx hated capitalism. It's all evil. All the problems of the world. If we defund the police and empty the prisons, the only reason there are prisons and there are police departments is to ensure the supremacy of the white race or something. Have you ever been to any country you can talk this way? Every country with people of color of every sort has police and prisons. Why is that? Because there's white people there? No. It's because there's bad people there. And police have to do some hard things. And I'm not going to hear to defend all the police things. But my point being is that the oppressors are evil and have no voice. And you can see this in all sorts of college places. You can see this in several corporations where people are told, even people who started the companies are forced out of their job because they're oppressors. Why are they oppressors? Because they gave money to a Christian group, for example. It's a good sign of being an oppressor. You're a bad person by definition. So the scales are really flipped in, in certain ways. If you are a certain person, again, a person of color who's um, maybe you're straight, but you're Christian, you're still in trouble. You're a bad person. Your Christianity will outweigh your good points, just like in Sister Who's case, his white maleness outdid his good points of being homosexual and pagan. So how does this work? Well, it slides all the time. And I don't want to bore you with even more stories. My point being is this is what's happening. This is what's being pushed on the streets. This is what... Uh, Ibram Kendi and um, Robin DiAngelo, top two selling books in Amazon for the last year. And now they're getting academics. Robin DiAngelo goes for $30,000 for a weekend to teach your company not to be white and all this kind of stuff. I mean, the money that is flowing is just amazing. And I sit back, and again, I'm not trying to pick on anybody in particular. Some of these people are white, some of these people are black, and all points in between. But this is Marxism that was put into the church, put into the society in all sorts of different ways. And so the long march the institutions, if you listen to them, if you read their stuff, their blogs and all this kind of stuff, they're excited, they're winning. That's exactly how they talk. All right, so there's a lot more to this. I mean, the heresies of James Cohn is very big in the black church. Uh, Gutierrez you know, brought this into the Catholic church. Now we have all sorts of Protestants. Again, I expect pagans to be pagan. What has bothered me over the last two years is all the Christian seminaries and Christian missionary organizations and Christian famous Christian pastors who have embraced this rhetoric that all white people are even by definition and all people that are black or brown are good by definition. That's just, you know, you can judge them. I grew up in a secular Jewish neighborhood in Los Angeles. None of my friends were observant ever. And I got along with all, all of them. But then I went to Seagate. We were with Chosen People Ministries, a Jewish ministry to outreach to, to Jewish people in New York City. We went there to help them. And um, we stayed in a place called Seagate, right by Coney Island. And this was a very orthodox community. I'd been around Jewish people my whole life, but not this kind of Jewish people. And so, you, you know, they're all got the, 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 the hair and they've got phylacteries on their hands and the wrists and they've got the tassels sticking out. This is a different group of people than I talked to before. So I was originally born in the South. You're supposed to be polite. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, sir. And I can't get a single person to respond to me. Not one. Wouldn't even look. 
there's this big cop there, much bigger than I am. I like to talk to cops. I'm a former cop. I like to see how he's doing on the job and what's going on. I couldn't even get him to look at me. Do you understand why? He knew by looking at me that I'm the wrong person. He judged by appearance. You remember Jesus saying something about this? When you judge, do not judge by mere appearance like the Pharisees do, but instead make a righteous judgment. Well, if you understand anything about Orthodox Judaism, it is the Pharisee movement just 2,000 years later. The Sadducees are wiped out when the temple's gone. The Pharisee movement became the rabbinical movement, which is where Orthodox Judaism in all its varieties is today. So this is my first time around people who judge me merely by the appearance I had, just like Jesus talked about 2,000 plus years ago. The Talmud, which is more important to the Orthodox movement than the Bible is, the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Talmud says the Gentiles, that's all of us for the most part, are nothing but fuel for the fires of hell. So why have a relationship with somebody who's just a log for the fire in eternity? So they won't talk. Terry and I got on a, their version of an elevated train, and we sat down, and there was a rabbi across from us. He took off his big hat and he put it in front of his face. He was not going to look at logs. And so I can't really talk to him when he's got this hat in front of his face. So I'm rude and obnoxious, I admit this. So I decided to witness to him by talking to my wife very loudly. And I'm reading several passages from the Tanakh, and I want him to hear how this is Jesus in the Old Testament. And it's just, you know, we're bad people because we don't look right. So this is the very thing that their scriptures say over and over again, you're not to do. You don't judge by appearance. You don't judge by partiality. You don't show partialness to people who aren't like you. Yet here's Black Lives Matter's and Antifa saying, no, you judge by appearance. That's the right way to know it. So I'm listening to one of the, the head guys at Southern Seminary, very conservative, where I was trying to finish my doctorate a couple of years back, talk about, hey, he was a racist from birth. Wow. How do you know this kind of thing? Skin color. So you're determined by your skin color? That's what makes you a good or bad person. That's where this has gone. Again, you won't find this version of communism in the Philippines. You won't find it in Kampala. You won't find it in India. But it's been a useful tool here because there is a bad history and the history of slavery and all this kind of stuff. But it is Christianity that stops slavery. It is not Marxism that stops slavery. Marx was a racist, so, as was Darwin. These guys had no use for people from Africa or Mexico or anywhere else. But somehow they're the saviors and Christianity is what's evil. That's the way the world's turned. So there's another twist in here, and I'm, I don't have much time, but this is the postmodern guys. These are the guys I really studied at the University of Denver. This is, well, from Nietzsche to Heidegger to Derrida, Foucault, and all these other guys. And two important things that come out of the postmodern movement. There's no such thing as truth. Well, how many times does the Bible talk about truth? When you read the Sermon on the Mount, do you hear Jesus saying, well, perhaps, perhaps, maybe, maybe, Truly, truly, he says over and over again, I say this to you. It's all over the book. The first time I run into this is at a Christian university where a guy's telling me, you can't say there's such a thing as truth. And I said, well, I can't say Jesus loves me. I can't say that I know that. No, 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 that's arrogant. Wow, what is this stuff? Postmodernism. Another thing that comes out of postmodernism is if you claim what you believe is true. So if I say the gospel is true, you need to believe in Jesus. You need to repent from Buddhism or you know, Marxism or or Islam or something like that, you are a terrible person. You're one of the worst persons on the planet because every time you say that something is true, what you're really saying is I want power over you. And that's all over these people. You can't talk about how the gospel is true, how the resurrection is true, or why you should believe in the Bible. You can't call it true because that makes you an arrogant, evil person. So these things have been mixed. And all the good postmodern writers, despite their claims that they were beyond Marxism, they're all Marxists, they're all friends in their day with Fidel and with Mao Zedong and all this kind of stuff. These are all bad guys. So nobody talks about Marx necessarily. Nobody talks about Hegel. Nobody brings up even Derrida Foucault because we have Robin DiAngelo and we have Ibram Kendi and Derek Bell and a host of other writers today that have become the coin of the land. So what does this look like in the end? Why am I going through all this nonsense? Why should you care? Because I think God has something to say to our culture. I think he has something to say to us. So I just want to give you God's justice versus man's justice one last time. 
Why is the social justice movement destined for failure? It has to fail. It's built in. Because they can't possibly be just. Why can they not possibly be just? Because they're not God. There is one who is good. There is one who is just. And I'm just going to do a little theology lesson. God is omniscient. What does that mean? He knows everything. Pretty simple, right? He knows everything. Do we? We take shortcuts. Oh, I don't like her. She's, she's dressed weird. Oh, look at that dude. He's a punker. Man, no, thank you. Oh, that person's the wrong color. Don't we do that as Americans and as human beings all across this planet all the time? We always take shortcuts. Jesus tells us not to, but we do. We constantly do it. We rationalize these things in our head. But our Father sees everything for who they really are. We're warned that their hearts are deceptively wicked. I can't even truly know my own heart, let alone yours or anybody else's. So how is I can judge you and call you a racist and a white supremacist or a zillion other things, and I don't even know you? How is that just in any possible way? But my father is just. He knows exactly who all of us are. Whatever race, whatever word you want to use, whatever tribe you come from, he knows everything. So when he is a judge, he is a righteous judge. And the Bible says this over and over again. And it ties in directly to the fact that he knows us. He knows the secrets of your heart, the good and the bad. Um, I'll say it in my case, the fact that I'm standing in front of you as a missionary, I was a stoner drunk idiot who wanted to kill his stepdad. God knew every bit of that, every bit of it, and much more than I'm telling you right now, and he still loved me. I was stunned by that. First time I ever heard that as a senior in high school. I never, never grew up in church, didn't believe anything, didn't know anything. Christianity was for losers and idiots. And I read about this God who knows everything I've ever done and still loved me. I'm in awe of that today. How is it God can know everything and love us anyways? It's an amazing thing. Well, this is part of why it's so important that we not try to be judges in categories in ways that we can't possibly be good judges. We don't know who you are. Just because we see your skin color, what does that tell us? Nothing. Because they see you're wearing a particular T-shirt. When I was a youth pastor in Aurora, Nebraska, a long time ago, the Satanism thing was coming into rock music and all this. And everybody was worried about Satanism amongst the kids. And my kid's wearing a Slayer shirt. Well, that, a lot of young men think that's cool. Does that mean he's a Satanist? Maybe you should talk to your son <laughs> instead of just assuming because of the shirt that he's what you think he is. I'm not saying he's not. I'm just saying you don't know without actually getting to know them. You want to find out what's in a person's heart? Maybe you should spend some time with them. Develop a relationship. Love them as Jesus would call you to do. We'll talk about that more. So God is omniscient. He sees what we can't see. Second thing, God is all loving. We are not, are we? We hear stories, and we hear stories through our opinions, through our bias, through our presuppositions, through our attitude this morning, and through a hundred other things that affect how we think about things. We are rarely objective. Philosophy always talks about objectivity, and I believe it, but it's tough to get there. You have to fight through a lot of prejudice in your own heart, a lot of bias in your own heart. That's the human condition. That's not the condition of you know, white Americans in the U.S. That is the standard human problem around a fallen world, is that we tend to see things through our own little prism, our own glasses, which are messed up. So we can't possibly be all loving like God is all loving. He sees past all these things. We tend not to see past these things. You hurt me. I don't like you. You, you know, a, a, a white person hurt me. Therefore, all white people are evil. A black person hurt me. Therefore, all black people are this. How do you make these statements? But people are doing it all over the place. I get a silly illustration I've given in my philosophy class. So I saw a black goose this morning. Therefore, all geese are black. And the students are smart enough, even at 8 in the morning, to pick up on that one. Okay, I saw a 1,000 black geese. Therefore, all geese are black. And they're all like, no, 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 sampling error, that's wrong. I saw a million geese and they're all black. Surely that makes me right. I can't say all geese are black until I observe all geese, can I? This is simple, straightforward, you know, two plus two is four type thinking. But somehow we go the other way. Oh, I mean, is this not the heart of all country music? Some woman did me wrong. Therefore, all women are evil or vice versa. Isn't that the way the songs go? I was listening to this Led Zeppelin album a couple years ago, and I said, boy, you put a steel guitar and twang, it's country music. It's all about some woman did him wrong. I've heard this song before. 
we generalize almost immediately out of our personal experiences. We are not all loving, but our Father is. God's justice is universal. God is not partial. One of the things we learn from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament, is that God judges Israel just like he judges their neighbors, doesn't he? When the Jews start acting like their pagan friends did, God punishes them as well. Just like he punishes the Canaanites, he punishes the Jews. Why? Because they're doing the same things. So God is interested in universal justice. He doesn't have special dumplings here and everybody else he hates, regardless of tribe, species, or anything else. His justice applies everywhere. It is wrong to kill in Detroit. It is wrong to kill in Minneapolis, just like it's wrong to kill in San Paulo and it's wrong to kill in Leningrad and anywhere else in this world. Our God cares. And I've had this discussion with Muslims and all sorts of other people, you know, who think, well, the Jews are the most evil people on the planet. And, and is it okay for them to murder mothers? I had this one young Muslim man tell me this. Is it okay for Jews to kill mothers and babies in their houses? And I said, no. Just as not just like it's not okay when Muslims do the same thing. I wasn't interested in having a political fight. I wanted him to see that God and his justice is universal. It applies to everybody. Nobody gets away with these things, whatever these things might be. God is also holy, and this is really where it gets ugly, because we are so not. I'm so driven by the fact every day that I am so not holy. Again, I don't understand God's love. I never have. I'm amazed by it, I'm overwhelmed by it, but I've never understood. It makes no sense to me. No, we should only love the people who, I was a drug addict. My whole family's drug addicts. Several in prison, some dead, on and on we go. And you don't trust anybody. You don't love anybody unless you can use them, unless they can help you get you high. That's the good of people. So does that sound like we're holy? Well, not anybody I know. I had a Catholic friend before as a Christian addict, we were, Hitchhiking, we passed a Catholic church, and my friend was a former Catholic. And you pass the, you see the windows with the yellow globes on people's heads, and I don't know anything. I said, "What's that mean?" He goes, "Oh, those are the saints, the Santos, the Hope." I said, "What's that mean?" He says, "The holy ones, the real good people." I'm like, "I don't know anybody like that." <laughs> Who's a really good person? I don't know. They're outside of my sphere, that's for sure. But our Father is different. He is holy. He is completely other in that sense. He does not do all the things that we do all the time. I tell a message about to when I've been speaking in people, different kinds of homes where there's been a lot of abuse. And I told him, I said, I have three dads. My first dad ditched me when I was a young kid, took off, nothing to do with us. Second dad came in and knocked me around, beat me up several times, all this kind of fun stuff. So I don't have a whole lot of good experience with dads. And then I meet my father who will never leave me who will never abuse me, who loves me and is here for me. And I was transformed by the idea of what a father is now. Completely different. He's not like what we see here so often. We can get a little taste of it, but we don't see it often. Okay, and our God's justice is, now this is the one that really disturbs Christians. Our God is an avenger. And we're like, no, our God is a teddy bear. He doesn't care how we act, no. That's not the God of the Bible. Even the, the prayer I read to you out of Revelation 6, when they're praying for God to avenge their blood on the earth, you know what? God is going to avenge murder and rape and slavery and every other evil that human beings on this planet have put across, all across this planet. Our God is going to take care of all that. Now, here's the good and bad news of the ones he already has. And this is why this is so important that we sing the praises of God's justice and not social justice movement. Because our God's justice and his love lead us to the cross of Jesus Christ. Where God is totally just. All of these murders and rapes and evil things that people have done, the slavery, the, uh, this go on, genocide and everything else was dealt with on that cross. It's hard to imagine when you think about it. This is why you have to, I was talking to Jehovah's Witness last week, you have to see the deity of Jesus so importantly when you see the sacrifice on the cross. Because now one of, I can't even bear my own sins. I always pick on my, my beautiful wife over here. She's always collecting other people's guilt and putting it on her own shoulders. I'm, honey, you're not even big enough to carry your own guilt, let alone somebody else's. How is it that Jesus could hold all of our sins on him? On that cross well that's the that's the message of the bible that nobody gets away with anything the difference now 
between when I say something like that and how we talk about it this morning is that some people know who Jesus is and believe in who Jesus is and know what he did for them, and it changes the world. There's no political discourse from some poli-sci professor at the university, I don't care what university you want to pick, that's ever going to change a human heart. But God can change the human heart, and he does that. He turns clansmen into people who love, people that they used to hate. He turns Nation of Islam members into people who love white people. It's it just, God changes people all over the place, and he always has. He's been doing this for a long time. I got to preach in the Philippines. This is, I've preached there many times, but one time it was memorable. I was in a little Filipino church, and the worship leader was Korean, and his whole family, he married a Filipino lady, and we love them, we know them for a long time. And so the church is Filipino, worship leader is Korean. Terry and I are there as the, the, you know, the, the pasty white American types. And right before I preach, a group of Japanese students come in and sit right in the front row, and I'm just, why am I, why? because 80 years ago, we're all shooting at each other. And here we are in the church, worshiping Jesus Christ together. What does Galatians say? In Christ, there is no slave or free, male or female, black or white, brown, Latino. No, in Jesus, none of this happens. Without Jesus, we face the wrath of God. He will avenge against our evil. With Jesus, it was paid for on the cross. That's the center of the Christian message. That's the gospel that's gone out for 2,000 years. You see it all over the early church. Loving people you're not supposed to love. Half of Rome is slave. Four million people. Two million of them are slaves is the estimate. Who are these slaves? Well, they're from all across Europe, and they're from all across the Middle East. There's Persians there, and Egyptians, and Greeks, and Jews, and Gauls from France, and Hispanics from Hispania, Spain, and there's Germania, there's German slaves, there's the Slavic slaves. The Russians didn't care what, excuse me, the Russians. The Romans didn't care what color you were. They enslaved everybody in sight, okay? So all these groups hate the Romans who have enslaved them and conquered their countries, but the, the thing is, is there's older hates there. Egypt and Persia have been at war for, oh, I don't know, a couple thousand years at this point. The Greeks had been at war with the Persians for quite a long time, the Battle of Thermopylae and all this kind of stuff we read about. The Gauls had been at war with Hispanics who had been at war with the Germanians, and on you go. These groups hated each other. Now they're all slaves underneath the Roman thumb. And here's this Christian thing like a cancer spreading all throughout the, primarily for the first 50 years, through the slaves. To the point where the Romans, one of their put-downs of the Christian church, oh, slave lovers. Thank you. <laughs> That's actually a compliment. Appreciate it. They didn't. They thought it was a, you know, a pejorative thing. What's going on? An Egyptian is loving a, a Persian. They don't love each other. They hate each other. These are different tribes. You don't think tribalism is still real? Look at what happened in Rwanda just 25 years ago. Or a zillion other places. The Han Chinese hate the other Chinese who aren't Han Chinese. It just goes on and on and on. So here's Egyptians, here's Greeks loving Persians. Here's Jews loving Egyptians. Here's people from Gaul, France, loving Germans. That's a weird one. In Jesus, things are changing. People are loving people they're not supposed to love. People are loving their enemies. And they're being transformed. And this whole phenomenon is spreading through the Roman Empire like a cancer. It's amazing. And it's because of what Jesus did. The verse that grabbed me, I kind of hinted at it before, Romans 5.8. I remember this is a senior in college, high school, excuse me, I'm high as a kite. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the really good people. No, he died for the ungodly. I, okay, <laughs> I certainly understand that. So what do we do as Americans now, as people in this church here in Lincoln? What does God call us to do? He calls us to be people of justice because God is a God of justice. We must be concerned with this issue, but we have to reclaim it back from the, what the culture has done with this. We have to call people to repent. If you are racist in this church this morning, stop, repent, stop it now. Repent from this. This is evil. This is wrong. But again, partiality can go in all sorts of reasons from class reasons. Oh, you're poor. I hate you. Or you're homeless. I can't stand you. On we go. No. Repent of all that. Secondly, and maybe the hardest thing is we have to love those who hate us. We have to love even our enemies. We have to love people who are screaming at us in the streets and telling us how evil we are. 
God does not say, you get to hate your enemies, that's okay, that's a special category. No, we don't have a choice here. We have to love them. He commands us to. That's his call. So let me read you one last thing. Please turn to Isaiah 53, the passage. This is the books we were giving out to the Jewish people in New York. And uh, it's nicknamed the, the hidden chapter because the rabbis won't read it in the synagogue. One quick little story before I read this. Our guide was a Jewish lady who was very much about my age, very much like the Jewish people I grew up with, very secular, didn't believe anything. She was in Brooklyn, though. And she gets saved. She comes to believe Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus is the Messiah. And this causes her parents to abandon her. Huge fight. This is very common in the Jewish world. You, you can be a Jewish Muslim, a Jewish Buddhist, a Jewish atheist. You can be anything but a Jewish believer in Jesus. That will get your parents to throw you away. So anyways, that had happened to her. But by the time we met her, she started to work back. And her mom was now having a relationship with her, not her dad. So at least she's had a partial relationship. So she tells us this amazing story. So she asked her mom, they're finally on speaking terms. She says, Mom, can I share something from the Tanakh, the Old Testament? Can I share something from the Tanakh with you? And her mom goes, sure, of course. Her mom's not a believer. She says, Sh of any kind. She's not even a, a serious Jew. Uh, of course you can. But don't you dare read from that New Testament. That's a Gentile book, and they hate us, and they want to kill us. And unfortunately, there's a little bit of history behind that. So there's a reason she came to that attitude. So, no, no Mom, I'm going to read this. So she starts reading what I'm about to read with you guys. And about five or six verses in, her mom starts screaming at her. This is a secular Jewish lady in New York. I told you not to read from the New Testament. And she turns it around and goes, Mom, this is our book. This is Isaiah. So let's read about what God does for us and what we can share with our neighbors and our people in the streets. Who has believed what he's heard from us? And to whom has the Lord of the arm been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. So the looks thing's not going to work here. He was despised and rejected by man, by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So our judgment was completely wrong. But surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Think about this for a second. For all my Hindu and friend, friends and Buddhist friends and Wiccan friends, I'm sorry. Sin is real. What we do matters. The choices we make hurts people. And God takes this. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we have seen him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. There it is again. Our sins. Famous New Age leader says, Jesus was a cosmic buffoon because he thought he could pay for other people's karma. Well, that's another whole argument, but it says that Jesus died for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. There is good coming out of this terrible, evil thing. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like a sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Justice is an issue there. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Wow. Yet as the will of the Lord to crush him, he, put him, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. Now notice we've gone from all this bad stuff and the price that Jesus pays. And now look at the, how the verse, even the tense of the language changed. We go to future tense now. He will see, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. There's the resurrection right there in Isaiah 53. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He's been put to death, and yet the will of the Lord is going to prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness, and he will bear their inequities. I could go on and on, but you get the idea here. It is Jesus that is going to bring about and deal with and provide for justice at every level. And that's what we have as a church all across this country, is we have the message of Jesus, the gospel that will change people, will turn their hearts inside out, will take them as racist or as bigoted, as prejudiced as anybody can be on anything else and turn them into somebody different and turn them into a lover of God 
and of the neighbor around him. Think of why Jesus picks, of all people he picks when he tells about the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? Well, if you're a Jewish guy in the first century, you're, you're fine with loving Avram and Shlomo and, and all these people next to you because they're like you. They're your tribe. But to love the Romans, to love the Greeks, and worst of all, to love the Samaritans who are worse than anybody in the, in the Jewish mind of that day. Imagine that. The, the Samaritans are half-breeds. It's a racial issue here. Are worse than the Romans who are slaughtering them? That's the Jewish mind 2,000 years ago. So when Jesus picks the Good Samaritan story, he picks the worst enemy these people have in their minds and makes him the good guy of the story. The guy that they need to realize who was the one that loved God and who was the one that loved his neighbor. That really bad guy over there. You can't judge by what you see. You cannot judge by what you think about that group. You've never met him or talked to him. That's God's call. And God has called us to love those people, no matter who they are, no matter how much of an enemy they are. So what can we do, church? We can love like Jesus loved. We can cross lines that we couldn't begin to cross on our own, but God has changed our hearts. And we need to be the ones in the streets, as it were, in the universities, telling people about God's mishpat, which finds its place in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, you are a just and holy God. And you're a loving God and a righteous God. And we could talk all day just about all these different things. And Father, we are not any of these things, but you chose to love us and make us different. You put us in Jesus. Father, if somebody here doesn't know Jesus, might this be the day. Grab them. Change their heart. For those of us that know you, Father, but have been in rebellion and caught up in prejudice and bigotry of all sorts, Father, change us too. Father, make this church an outpost here in this town that doesn't like you. Make them a, literally a changed agent of your message, of your gospel, that brings real justice to this world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jonathan's going to close with a song, and uh, there'll be a couple of men up front to pray for you. If the uh, Lord's touched your heart, you need to be healed, uh, whatever, they're up here to, to minister to you. Um, one of the things that came to mind and um, comes from Isaiah 6 is uh, Isaiah in chapter 5 said, whoa, 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 to all of the nation of Israel. Woe is you, woe is you, woe is you. And then in chapter 6, um, he has a vision of being in heaven. I think it was a, a, a reality. And uh, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the angels were singing, and we've already sang the song earlier, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, our Lord of hosts. Uh, the, old, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And then when he saw the Lord lifted up, he said, Woe is me. Woe is me. Because he's unholy. And, you know, am I here to condemn you? Not at all. You know, Jesus, you're set apart. But at the same time, it's very easy to get this place where they're cannon fodder for hell. And we're safe and we're going in the rapture. No, I think we've been exhorted and encouraged today to do what? To love the unlovable, right? The people that were sinners like we were. And sometimes it takes seeing the Lord and seeing ourselves in light of who he is, but not to condemn us, but to, to really bring ourselves before him and go, man, without your mercy, God, without your mercy, there go I. And so if you, you know, need to commit your way to Jesus Christ and know him, men will be up here to pray for you. 
whatever the case may be. But as the song closes, and then I'm going to ask you to sit there because we got to set up so you can eat back there. So there's going to be some people setting up. So when they get it all set up, then you be free to mosey around. So. Yeah, they have their table up here with their information. So come visit it, uh, newsletter, different things that they're doing. So take advantage of that. Stop by, say hi. Uh, if you uh, have uh, feel burdened to give money, just designate it for Haven Ministries, put it in the, and we'll make sure they get it. So.